Stanford University. Welcome back to Hacking Consciousness. And today should be very exciting because we will have a live EEG demonstration by Dr. Fred Travis, who came all the way here. It's uh, quite a pleasure to have him here. He's the uh, director of, as you can see, the Brain Consciousness and Cognition Center in uh, Fairfield, Iowa, of Marisha University, where he also got his master's and PhD. And for the past 23 years, he's been studying brainwaves. He's been studying um, them so extensively that he's published over 70 papers on them. And what he's found is that there's a pattern between what your frontal lobe coherence is and your performance in any field of activity, whether it's sports, whether it's business, et cetera. And I'm sure you'll love to talk more about it. So please welcome Dr. Fred Travis. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Michael. Now, I'd like to have a very interactive discussion. So I'm going to ask people, if you will, if you come down maybe to the first six rows or so. And that way, when you ask a question, I can hear it and other people can hear it. So we'll be tying together a lot of the discussion that's happened at earlier lectures, specifically around higher states of consciousness. And we'll be looking at this relative to how the brain develops, how experience changes the brain. And I'm putting it in the larger context of we create our reality. And I'm suggesting this not in the new age grand eloquence way, where they say it in hushed tones, but in terms of the actual mechanics of the nerves of the veins, just how your brain is actually functioning. So I'm going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I'm going to open up for questions and talk again in questions. So first, how do we process? Whenever we see anything right now, information comes in, and it takes two paths. It's called the low road and the high road. The low road goes to the most primitive part of the brain, the brain stem, and there's an automatic response. What this does is structures a mood in the mind. It could be positive, it could be negative, it could be approach, it could be avoidance. When four o'clock came around and you said, oh yeah, <coughs> hacking consciousness, that brought some feeling in the mind. Should I go or should I go to the ocean or should I go out to the woods? There was some feeling that came. At the same time, what happens is a high road is where you actually process the information. That's where you actually see what's out here. But notice, what you see isn't really what's there. What you see is a combination of this emotional tone plus what actually is there. Now, this has very real consequences, especially in in-group, out-group type situations. They looked at sports fans, soccer and baseball. These were New York Yankees and Red Sox fans. They had them in a scanner. They showed them a video. And in the video, someone got hurt. Now, if it was the person that was on your team, the part of your brain, as you see, that became active is a part of the brain which is empathy, which is approach beha uh, behavior, trying to help the situation, experience what the other person is experiencing. If it was someone on the other team, the part of your brain that became active was your pleasure circuit. <laughs> and that structures the mood in the mind, and that's when you have the feeling coming in. And while you might say, well, this might be true for fanatic baseball players, think of how you feel when you're going down 101 when everyone else is trying to get into the city and they're completely blocked up and you're going 65. Think of how you feel. You're happy. You're good. <laughs> this has also real ramifications, racial profiling. They took policemen. They, they showed them a video of a youth pulling something from his pocket. And half the time it was an iPod, half the time it was a gun. And they asked the police officer to respond as quickly as possible, because they have to. And then they had one other um, variable, and that was half the time it was a youth of color, half the time it was a white youth. When it was a youth of color, as you see here, 85% of the time the policemen saw a gun. Again, this is low road, high road. And that's their reality. That's what really was there. 85% of the time, if it was a white youth, they saw an iPod. So this is what we're doing. We, we don't get a, a neutral picture of the world and take it into consciousness, but we're actually creating it. We're creating our reality, and based on what we think is there is how we respond. 
Now, before we go on to talk about the brain, are there questions on this? Now, Michael, did you tell everyone they have to ask one question before they get to leave? <laughs> yes, sir. Is your microphone turned on or is it off? Uh, <laughs> I have no microphone. It's uh, actually for recording. There'll be interference otherwise. Very practical question. So let's go on because this low road and high road, it's not, it's not built in. It's not like a computer. When we get a computer, we open up the case, we pull out the computer, we push the on button, and then it bings on and away you go. The brain's not like that. When you're born, your brain is unassembled. Imagine buying a computer, reaching into the box and pulling out a bag of, of components. That's the baby's brain at birth. They don't see the world. They don't hear the world as a, as a sequence of sounds. They don't see a head and a neck and a shoulder. They don't see mama and daddy. It's all disconnected sounds, sights. And what happens is the brain is developing, specifically over the first 20 years of life. What this is looking at is connections between the neurons, the brain cells. Uh, the x-axis here is, um, this is time in years. This is, uh, the y-axis is the number of connections between brain cells. We see it goes up from between zero and three. It goes up so fast the child is making 24 million new connections every minute. So when your baby's sitting there lying there, you know, what are they doing? They're making 24 million <laughs> new connections every minute. And that's how they're able to do what they're doing. In three years, they get to control and move the body. They get to parse the sounds into individual words. They get to attach meaning to the words. You know, why is this happening? Because of if the brain is the interface between inner and outer, that's how we're understanding the world. They have all these possible connections already made. And then they remain high from about 3 to 10, and then there's a process of pruning. And this is happening in all parts of the brain and also in primates as well as humans. In each of these graphs, uh, these are years, they start at age 10, and we see a decrease, this pruning process going on. Now you may think, well, that's too bad. You know, how come we're losing connections? You know, is it something bad? Can we do something to keep connections? Is anyone here a gardener? Yeah, what happens when you prune your bushes, sir? They look better and they grow. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a little bit counterintuitive. You're cutting off branches. But what you're doing is you're cutting off the branches that are not very fruitful. And that's allowing the intelligence and the nourishment of the plant to go to those areas that are strong. This is what's happening in your brain. It's very much like pruning analogy. You're eliminating the connections you have not used during those first 10 years. Now there's physical space. There's also energy to allow the areas that you have used to get bigger. What you're doing in this whole process between 10 and 20 is it, so you're freeing the individual from the stone. And if you have children, I have three daughters, and up to age 10, life is just bliss. They like to walk with daddy, they hold daddy's hand. At 10, they only hold my hand if none of their classmates are around. At 16, they don't even walk with me. They say, Dad, I'm fine, go ahead. <laughs> 20 feet behind. And what is happening is as the connections are dropping off, their sense of self is beginning to emerge. Now something else is happening, that's the connections between the brain cells. It's called myelination. This is an output fiber here, and it actually gets wrapped in this fatty layer. And what it does is it speeds up the flow of the action potential about 20 times. So this is also going on. It goes on at different rates in different brain areas. The first part, is the sensory system and the motor system. So the child is born, they, don't, they can't move their body, they can't see the world. The first thing that happens is they get to deal with the outside concrete world. In about six months of age, the brain has been reorganized so they can see the world. The ears, by two years, have organized so you can hear sounds. Now before that time, again, the information goes slowly. You may remember playing catch with your son or daughter when they're three or four. They stand like this. The ball hits their chest. It bounces on the floor. And then they close their arms. And you say, keep your eye on the ball. Well, they can actually compute the ball in space as well as you or I at that age. 
but the connection leaves the brain, it goes down the neck, goes to the spinal cord, goes out to the arm. It takes a long time because those connections are not myelinated. Similar things happening between the connections between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. They myelinate between age 7 and age 10. And at that time, the child can begin to think more quickly. They can begin to have one specific idea, left hemisphere relative to the larger idea, right hemisphere. The next area is the core of the brain. It's called a reticular activating system that helps the child keep their attention at a very set level. If you go into a group of third graders, their attention is just all over the place. Some people are hyper, some people are really down. In the fifth or sixth grade, they're able to have attention at a more controlled level. Now the last parts of the brain to myelinate are the connections between the rest of the brain and the front of the brain. The front of the brain is important. I put CEO here. That's not a neuroscience term. <laughs> Chief Executive Officer. That's what this part of your brain does. It gets information from all other parts of the brain, puts it together, and sends it back out. Connections between the rest of the brain and this part of the brain start to myelinate at age 12, continue through age 25. Now this is getting into the mass media. Here's a cartoon. Scientific studies show that the decision-making parts of the human brain aren't fully developed until the age of 25. Here's two teenagers. They have their skateboard there. This is the next slide in the cartoon. <laughs> so then we have an excuse for this. We create our reality. If your brain circuits are telling you one thing, that's your reality. And for teenagers, the whole rest of their brain is completely developed. They can see a situation. They can come up with a plan. It's their plan. They're very passionate. They want to do it. The ability to see the big picture isn't there. And that's why teenagers, especially 14, 15-year-old boys, have the stereotype of making rash decisions. And just think of yourself at that age. Then around 18 or 19, they begin to settle down. Now they're into to college. But even between college, freshman, and senior, there's a huge difference. This is showing the changes between uh, basically high school and college. The changes are primarily with the front of the brain, the ability to see the big picture, the ability to compute consequences. So we create our reality. As your brain is changing, so the reality, what you think is there, is constantly changing. We're also creating the low road response. We're actually programming the low road response, but this is happening more through experience. Questions up to this point? Let's move to the second point, neuroplasticity. Your brain is a river and not a rock. 70% of your brain connections change every day. So you're going to leave here at 6, and the world's going to be a different place. Well, actually, the world's going to be the same place. But we've considered some ideas here. There'll be some discussion here. There'll be different connections here. What you'll be doing is how you see the world will be changing. There's the how fairy tales end, now they live happily ever after. Never happens with the brain. From your first breath to your last breath, everything you're doing is dynamically changing the brain. And this is, this is new. Well, it's 15 years, 20 years now. But it's completely galvanized neuroscience. Because what this means is, by your decisions, you can decide your brain connections. This is work done by Michael Merzenich. Uh, Michael, you see San Francisco. He's the one who's done most of the research that has really brought this to the fore. What he did in this, he took aged chimpanzees and he touched their fingertips and he looked to see how the brain was functioning, how the brain was reacting. You actually have a body map up here in your brain. So when you touch your fingers, your hand, your arm, you trace out this distorted figure up in your brain. So there's a very hardwired known relationship between the brain and, and the fingers. In the research, all he did is he touched the fingertips with a vibrator for 20 minutes a day for about three months. And then he asked, now, how does the brain respond when we touch the fingertips? Can you see what's happened? 
yeah, it's bigger. Now, it's not as though it's growing. You know, after a while, oh, I just don't have any more room. I can't take that next class. <laughs> it's not as though we're, the brain's growing, but what's happening is we're allocating 100 billion processors differently, moment by moment, depending on what we put our attention on. So those of you who've been to the Ayurvedic consultants and they've taken your pulse and they've told you these incredible things, but what's happened is they've been taking thousands and thousands of pulses and they've actually used more of their brain to process what's coming through their fingertips. They're actually able to detect more information. Let me just show you how much the brain changes. This is from a zebrafish. This is the cell body here. This is the output fiber. Uh, these are uh, the branches, are the dendrites, the input fibers. And the dot you see here is a synapse. That's where another cell is talking to this cell. And I'm going to show you consecutive one-minute frames. And notice how this changes. So notice how the dendrites are moving in space. Now it's zooming in. Notice how they're jump, jumping out. Notice how these dots are dramatically changing. This is minute by minute. So when you're sitting in class, you're actually changing your brain functioning to take in the information. And a good professor will repeat it two or three or four times. And what that does, it helps to make those connections more strong. Here's a real life example. These are law students who studied for their law exam versus those law students who did not do any extra work. Um, this is looking at myelination. So myelination is the white matter. It makes information go more quickly. It's blue if it's higher. And what we see is many connections with the frontal areas of the brain have grown just by adding additional focus. So college is changing your brain. There should be a little disclaimer when you sign up to come to Stanford and say this college education will change your brain. <laughs> because that's what it's doing. And it's dependent on where your decisions go. Is it going to be art or computer science or management or literature or whatever you'll be doing? Let's just look at some other examples of experience changes the brain. This is looking top down, back part of the brain. This is where the visual system is. And this is what's active when you or I are reading a book. But what happens if you're blind? If no information is going from your eyes to the back part of your brain, does it just sit there? No. This is a blind person reading Braille. This is the part of the brain that they use. Notice the part of the brain that we use for vision, they're using for touch. This is the plasticity of the human brain. By the way, it takes about a year for this to happen. They've looked at people who have lost their sight, and they've seen how long has it taken them to take information in through their fingertips. And it takes about a year. But it happens. The brain is a river and not a rock. We're creating our reality. With each experience, we're creating different circuits, which are then determining how we see the next point in time. Now this also has the other side of the coin, and that is stress. Stress affects brain functioning. They, um, the way that they operationalize stress is how many times have you heard guns being shot, someone being beat, beaten up, getting stabbed, etc. From never to th more than three times. And then they put them in the four quartiles, and you see the more stress that a, a person has been under, uh, the lower is their measured IQ, also the lower is their reading. What's also found is under stress, the frontal areas of the brain get physically smaller. Just living in a big city versus rural living has its effect. Um, urban was 100,000 people or more. Rural was 10,000 or less. So more mood disorders, anxiety. The amygdala. The amygdala is our survival signal. So if you're fighting traffic, if you're fighting time, if there's noise, the amygdala is just permanently high. And this leads to long time brain changes in the brain. Now just before I finish this part on neural plasticity, I want to just dis distinguish stress from challenge. Because some of you might be feeling, I need stress to get going. You know, I don't, unless I have that pressure, I don't really start to do anything. 
I think what you're talking about is challenge. Under challenge, what happens is the core of the brain, the brain stem, activates the whole brain. Under challenge, the sensory systems are firing more quickly. The CEO of the brain passes information through more quickly. We know the feeling of challenge. We have lots of creative ideas, lots of mental energy, lots of physical energy. What happens when the challenge gets too high and we say it's too much, the brain actually downshifts and there's a stress response. The CEO is turned off. The amygdala, the fear center, is turned on. We have a sympathetic fight or flight response. And now you've gone from lots of creative ideas to no creative solutions at all. From lots of mental and physical energy to just no energy at all. So the challenge for today's world is to raise this ch challenge stress line. And this is something which um, I think meditation contributes towards, to allow us to take on more challenge without it becoming stress. Questions? <laughs> Yes, sir. Myelination. Yeah. How can it happen quickly? Um, it's it is myelination, but it's also the connection between brain cells. The number. And when we looked at the zebrafish, and you saw the branches moving and the actual dots coming and going, that's more of what they see for the 70% of the brain changing. The myelination is fat, and it needs it in your diet. So if, you don't, if, if you're malnourished, what happens is that part of, the, part of the brain breaks down, and it leads to cognitive problems because information starts going more slowly. Yes, ma'am. Does that occur on the, the main part of the, of the neuron, or is, uh, does it include also the dendrites in every single section of it? Only the output fiber, the axon. Yeah. Okay. And what it's, the way it works is when the axon isn't coated with fat, the action potential creates a change sequentially at each point on the axon. It takes a long time. When it's myelinated, of course, that keeps water-soluble things away. So the changes only happen between the myelin nodes. And so it actually it jumps from point to point, and that speeds up the whole process. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the decision. Sorry, I should have asked this in the last section. About the decision-making capability fully developing only at 25. Is that some scientific research which says which explains why you're allowed to drive at 16 and make decisions at that time, and you're allowed to drink at 21. Is there some, something that connects it to how developed that part of the brain? Not to brain development, but notice you can't rent a car until you're 25. The actuaries looked at incidents of accidents and found that when it asymptotes off. But on that basis, should the license to drive also be given? <laughs> they often, most states now have graduated driving laws. And also, as parents, you want to institute things like first your kid drives for a year with nobody else in the car. Because the frontal lobes primarily are taking care of distraction. And there was um, a, a video on YouTube of these teenagers driving, and there was a camera in the back. They went through red lights, they ran stop signs, and they're just talking, having a grand old time. So first thing is not to have the distractions and then two people in cars and, and so on. Because what you want to, remember experience changes the brain. You want them to develop the driving habits and unfortunately the only way to do it is by driving. But you have to make sure they're in a, a safe, structured situation so that if they do make a mistake, it's not too terrible. And this understanding of the brain is coming into, especially to, into um, law situations. Not that someone who's a teenager should not be blamable for what they do, but they're more adaptable. The brain is still changing, and so rehabilitation can actually help. And so that should be more in line of what you sentence the person to. That's good. Other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question about myelin. 
Uh, I, I don't, I believe parts of the brain are not myelinated. Uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves, and my uh, neurons is a bit uh, weak, but I believe they are not myelinated. So what is the function of myelin, which you seem to dwell on a great deal? Well, sympathetic, parasympathetic, um, when you get out into the periphery, so then the myelin is, can or cannot be there, but definitely in the brain it's there. The thing about the sympathetic nervous system is it leaves the brain and it goes out just outside the spinal cord, and there's groups of neurons that are called ganglia, and these are not myelinated. But then where they go to the target organ, that is myelinated. It's actually a different type of myelin. It's called a Schwann cell. But the fat, the myelination is a way for the body to speed up, to optimize its functioning. At birth, you don't have it because that would deprive the mother of all the fat that is in her. And so that's why kids like to eat butter. And we, we told our girls, don't eat the butter right from the plate. And so they would take it. So they'd take it, they'd put it on their plate, and then they'd eat it. And they crave these omegas because their, their body is adding so much fat, so much myelin to the, all parts of the body. There was another question. Yes, Crystal. Um, this is back on the racial profiling research that you showed. Yes. So has this research been shown to you know, police departments nationally? And if so, have there been any programs to help police officers retrain their work? Um, yes, it has been shown. I don't know about any programs. I did go to the FBI for three consecutive years for conferences to see how spiritual experiences could help reduce the toxic effects of their day-to-day -day experience. Because experience changes the brain, and if what you see is crime and abuse and negativity, that's what's being structured in your brain. It's like being fed a constant stream of nightly news, and you think that's the reality of the world when it isn't. So there's a realization of this amongst law enforcement. Because they have bulletproof vests and it keeps the bullets from coming in, but the toxic effects on the person's spirit needs to be dealt, dealt with as well. Other questions? Yes, sir. How do you maintain a consistent sense of identity if your brain's restructured 70% every day? Great question. How do you maintain a consistent sense of identity? The way it's done is through not structure, but function. So you, and what I mean by that is you're having continual activation primarily from the brain stem up to the cortex and back to the, excuse me, the thalamus, up to the cortex, back to the thalamus. And that can be maintained even if some individual cells are dropping out. Here we have the thalamus, and there's two parallel roads that go through the thalamus. We talked about low road and high road. These are two other roads, and that is the information comes in from outside, and that gives us content. So that's me, that's the PowerPoint. That goes up to the brain, and this is one level of how the brain is changing. The actual ongoing experience is changing that. But there's also wakefulness coming up through the spinal cord up to the thalamus. And what comes from outside goes to specific nuclei. What comes from down below goes to, it's distributed throughout the whole thalamus. And what this does is it creates loops with the cortex, but this is maintaining wakefulness. So these two things are coming together, content and wakefulness. The wakefulness is your sense of self. And that wakefulness is it's a distributed functioning of throughout the thalamus to all parts of the cortex, which is just maintaining being awake. You know how you feel at 9 or 10 or 11. You just find that you're less able to at night. You're less able to deal with the world. That's because the wakefulness circuits are slowing down, even though the content circuit is remaining the same. So what is changing as we're growing up is the character of these wakefulness circuits are changing from a 5-year-old to a 10-year-old to a 15 to a 20. And as that is happening, your sense of self is becoming deeper and deeper. And that's actually the next point that we're speaking about is just growth of higher states of consciousness, growth of a um, higher sense of self. Other, that was a very good question. Other questions? Let's go to higher states of consciousness. 
The point I like to make is they're inherent in the human nervous system. You don't have to bring anything from the outside in. All you need are the proper experiences to build the circuits to support. And let's take a step back. When we were growing up from sensory motor, when we were kids from three or four to five or 10, language is an important tool for developing abstract thinking. Vygotsky ties development very much into language, that we internalize the culture. And the way we internalize the culture is through language. And what it's doing is it's creating a symbolic form that frees us from the object. But now what happens is we're identified with, we're caught in the symbolic form. We're caught in our thoughts, our categories. We're caught in our paradigms. And so to continue to grow, we need something which will transcend that. Um, Charles Alexander, a very systemic thinker, tied Piaget's stages of cognitive development with different levels of functioning. Where what we have is when a child is two or three or four, their sense of self is very much in terms of their senses. And that's where their primary locus of functioning is. Everything is in terms of objects. And if you're, if you're taking care of a two or three year old and they're unhappy, you give them something new and their unhappiness disappears. Because whatever is on the screen is, is where their awareness is. And this is correlating with just the increasing of connections. And then between three and seven, the next level is pre-operational. Pre-operational, the child doesn't really yet have operational thinking, but what they have is the beginning of it. And they begin, can begin to take a symbol and realize the symbol has real um, reality to it as well. You give a child at this age a box with a present, and they look at the present, throw it out, and play with the box. Because with a the box, they can conceive it as being many different things. This is this period. This is a time of having maximum number of connections. Now, as the right and left part of the brain begin to myelinate, we see the emergence of the next Piaget stage, concrete operations. Now you can think about external objects. And you realize that objects maintain their identity as they change shape. To get from sensory motor to here, you need language. You need to be able to have the symbol for an object. As they continue to grow, prefrontal connections, we come up with Piaget's formal operations. In formal operations, you can think about thinking. And for Piaget, this is the highest form of human development, highest form of adult development. I mean, it really leaves a lot out. And and what's happening in former operations is you get stuck in your ideas. And you get academics very angry at each other because of their ideas. You get wars because of ideas. We're stuck in thoughts. We're stuck in concept. We're stuck in our symbolic representation. So what Charles Alexander says is we need to transcend language. This is his quote. I'll let you read it. To continue development, to allow the self to continue to expand, you need to transcend thought. You need to transcend concepts. That's why he talked about transcendental meditation. I like to just talk about different meditations to see why he might have said this. Meditations fit into at least three categories, focus attention, um, open monitoring, automatic self-transcending. Focus attention is as it sounds. It's voluntary focusing on a specific object. Open monitoring is non-reactive monitoring or dispassionate observation of the content of experience from moment to moment. In focus attention, you keep one thing in the lens of experience. In open monitoring, you just allow everything to pass through experience. These two have been delineated by Anton Lutz to describe meditations in the Buddhist tradition. Jonathan Shear and I added this third category, automatic self-transcending. And this is any meditation that transcends the steps of meditation. Meditations in the first two categories keep you involved in thinking. Automatic self-transcending, you start with thinking, and you just go to being, wakefulness. You transcend thought, transcend content. So once we had these descriptions, we asked, what does neuropsychology say happens in the brain in terms of EEG? 
When you're focusing, this is what you see. It's called gamma. It goes up and down 20 to 50 times a second. When you're just following internal processing, you see theta 2. This is it here. It's primarily in the front of the brain. When the attention is turned within and you're just awake, alert, this is the brain wave you see. Uh, this is time here. Um, this is a second. It's called alpha 1. Goes up and down 8 to 10 times per second. And notice it's over the whole brain. As the mind is settling down to the state of just wakefulness without thought, so we see the brain is settling down to a state which is seen over the whole brain. So then we ask, what are the meditations that report gamma? And they include Zen, compassion, compassion, Shi Kong. Theta is mindfulness, Kriya Yoga. Alpha One, transcendental meditation. Also a 45-year case study of a Qigong master. It's an interesting collection here. Um, when this person first started his Qigong practice, it was gamma because it's a controlled process of moving energy through the body. After 45 years, once he started the practice, he reported this Alpha One EEG. And it's bringing out how automaticity can be gained. Automaticity is something psychology has talked about for 30, 45 years. Any controlled process can become automatic with lots of practice. And automatic just means that it goes by itself, doesn't take additional resources. So we see with this Qigong master going through a very focused, controlled process over and over was able to achieve this value of automatic self-transcending to go beyond thought. Transcendental meditation, it's built into the process. So it happens very quickly in the first week or so. So then we asked, what's happening in neural imaging? So we looked at, um, this is concentration meditation, top down, PET scan. Large areas of the brain are active because you're using lots of resources. This is mindfulness meditation compared to math. Brain is looking that way. This is the part of the brain. It's called the anterior cingulate gyrus. It's your attention switcher. And so if you're moving your attention from experience to experience, that's the part of the brain that you would use. Transcendental meditation, what we find is an interesting pattern where the front of the brain, the CEO of the brain, the part of the brain that's putting everything together, there's increased blood flow. The core of the brain, the brain stem, that's breath rate, heart rate, activation, primitive response, blood flow is lower. We talk about this experience as restful alertness. This is the rest for the mind and the body. This is the alertness. And again, experience changes the brain. So the value of whatever meditation you're doing is bringing that state into daily activity. What's the uh, significance of the difference in color, yellow, red, and green, or yellow, red, and green? Um, OK. This blue means, uh, red means increase, blue means decrease. Here they show the increase with this yellow color. Here it's uh, red is again high. Uh, it's, it's the opposite, and blue is low. So uh, it's, it's confusing, isn't it? I didn't notice that before. This is usually what they do with PET. This is typically what they do with MRI. S to understand these different meditations, um, meditations and focus attention and open monitoring teach you to construct mental tools to better cope with life. Be it being mindful so that you have some space between you and whatever experience you're in, so you're able to have some perspective on it. It's almost like you're being used to being taught how to use a knife in a different way. Your mind's like a tool. Meditation's an automatic self-transcending. Rather than teaching you how to use the knife in a different way, you stop using the knife and you sharpen it. And then when you take the sharp knife back to activity, everything is improved. Everything is enhanced. And I think that's why um, in this set of mile did a, a meta-analysis of 23 psychological variables. And just the effect size, the x-axis here is effect size. What's the magnitude of the effect? Was just much greater from transcending during TM versus other meditations. I'm going to stop and take questions and then just go a little bit more deeply into this experience of pure consciousness as it relates to higher states. Yes, ma'am. Make a little 
few more statements about coping with content and whatever that second thing was that you just talked Constructing mental tools versus changing mental state? Well, the one right after that, you said coping with content. I see. Yeah. Changing mental state. Yeah, so coping with content, meaning he's using a cognitive tool to deal with a specific situation. And so maybe in compassion meditation, where you develop a very positive, strong experience of inner compassion. So that's there when you're dealing with outer activity. That's versus changing mental state, is you're actually changing what is the field upon which the content is falling. What is the, uh, the state upon which um, ongoing experience is falling? It's very much, um, as we're talking about these different uh, sensory motor and so on, what is the sense of self upon which the experience is falling? And depending on that will depend upon how you see the world, how you respond to the world. Good. Yes, ma'am. Wondering if the brain doesn't stop developing until about the age of 25, has it always been that way during our evolution? And if so, I'm, I'm wondering why we were created to go through puberty and have the ability to have children at 13, 14, 15, <laughs> or whatever, and then to be parents for 10 years while our brains were still. Lacking some it's a very, re very real question. I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> has it always been that way? I think it has. Um, they, this whole change of increase and decrease in connections and seen in primates as well as in humans. And so it seems like it's what this nervous system is built to do to allow us to shape it to fit into whatever the situation is that we're in. And why, did, why does it take that long for full, full common sense to come to the brain? It may be that it allowed people to try things that um, an adult would, would never try. That's foolish. You don't want to do that. And a teenager tries it, and it might work. So it may have been nature's way to continue to allow change and new thinking to come into the, the process. Yes? brain when we get wisdom, like I know I've heard CEOs say, you know, you don't know what the hell you're doing until you're 60. You know, is, does wisdom have something to do with the brain development? Yes. What, what, what I'm going to be showing you is um, thickness of the brain. If it's blue or purple, it's very thick. If it's red, it's very thin. And it's going to be over, starts at age seven. And what you're seeing here is these are all sensory areas. What you see here is this is where you create a concrete picture of the world. Now the brain's looking at you. Notice how the frontal areas remain thick throughout life. So this is 27, 37, 47, 57, 67, 77, 87. So this is temporal area. This is uh, details of experience. That's very thin, suggesting that that's not being used much in processing. This is touch. This is cross-modal matching. This is where you take the outside information and create a picture. But notice the input to that is, is diminished. This is the CEO. So what is happening is as you get older, when you look at the world, you're seeing it less and less as an objective, um, fragmented, isolated picture. What you're seeing it more and more is in terms of its symbolic content. You see it more in terms of the flow. Well, this happened 10 years ago. This happened 30 years ago. You have that whole picture of time, and you can see how each event is part of the whole. And so I think that's why this, this idea of wisdom comes out, is because how you're experiencing the world has fundamentally changed.
Good. Other questions? Let's continue to go down the road of higher states. <coughs> so the process of transcending, to understand it, um, we need to understand that the, the brain, the mind is, has a vertical dimension. Surface level is conscious thoughts. At the depth is where we have intuition, creative ideas. What we're doing with transcendental meditation is taking a specific thought, experiencing it at earlier and earlier levels of development. What's happening is the content is becoming less primary, and the underlying field of consciousness, we call it pure consciousness, is becoming more primary. The underlying field of wakefulness, which is putting things together, is becoming more the major content of experience. <coughs> I asked students to write their descriptions of these experiences, and I asked them their deepest experiences during TM practice, and I told them I didn't want to hear jargon. I wanted to hear what it felt like. What is it like to eat a strawberry? You know, tell me what it feels like. Then we did something called content analysis. Content analysis, you take phrases and you see what's the idea that they encode, and then you see how many times those phrases are used. And these are the three phrases we saw most. This experience is characterized by the absence of time, space, and body sense. Absence of time, absence of space, absence of body sense. Now these three matrices is what gives meaning to waking. The experience we're having right now is time. It's early evening. It's in this space in Jordan Hall. And there's some body sense. You're experiencing it from where you're sitting. Now notice this experience of transcendental consciousness, the very framework of waking state has disappeared. Let's just see the relationship of this experience of pure consciousness with waking, sleeping, and dreaming uses two by two grid. Sense of self, yes or no. Content, yes or no. What would be this one here where there's no sense of self, no thoughts? Sleep, very good. You know you've had a good night's sleep when you've lost awareness, unconscious. How about here, sense of self and thoughts? Waking, yeah, that's what we're in right now. Yes, you hope. There's content coming in, but there's you who is experiencing it, reflecting on it. I'd like to suggest that this is dreaming, where you have these vivid dream images. Typically, the self is completely lost. You're just identified with that. That leaves this cell, sense of self, but no thoughts. Now, if you ask any psychologist, they'll say, that's not possible. That's what William James said. He says, I don't see an abiding sense of self. All I see is changing streams of consciousness, changing content. Psychologist Nat Zolis were saying, how can you be aware of yourself if you're not aware of some aspect of your individuality? The fact that you're thinking or experiencing and so on. Well, meditation practice gives this experience, transcendental consciousness. And notice it's qualitatively different than the other four. Also, we looked at brain waves. This is a, a more full representation. Again, the x-axis is time. Each line is a different part of the brain. Um, this is a second. This is the alpha activity. It goes up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. That's that eight to 10 hertz alpha. Notice it's over the whole brain. What we're going to do now is, Luis, you could come up. I'll record them so you can actually see them later. Okay, great. <coughs> Luis, you recently learned? I did, yeah, about a month ago, I say, at this stage. Three weeks ago or a month ago. Yeah, I started. So what we'll do is we'll look under the hood. And we'll look at 
Louise's brain waves when she's just sitting, her eyes are open, and then we'll have her uh, start TM practice. And then we'll look more globally about what's seen. So these first two lines, there's electrical activity coming from this sensor and this sensor. This one's a ground. This line here is looking at something called coherence. Remember when you're looking at all the electrical activity, it tended to be going up and down together? Mathematically, you can calculate the rise and the fall of each wave, and you ask, how is that related? And that gives us coherence. So coherence is, I have to look at the people. <laughs> coherence goes from down here is zero up here to one. And notice it's highly variable. And this is a healthy brain. What is happening is, is when 50 people are looking at you, you're seeing them, you're processing them, some friends, some strangers, colors, memories, all these things are going on, and we're seeing the coherence is just going up and down and up and down. These are eye blinks here. You can blink your eyes, Louise. Now this isn't actually coming from the brain. It's the eye muscles, the eyelids, when they go up, they shear off some electrons, and it makes that shape. And this is... This is very fast. So here's a second. You see this is going up about 20 or 30 times per second. This is a typical brain wave when the brain's awake and you're processing the world. What kind of brain waves are we seeing now? I mean, is it predominantly gamma or how would we distinguish? Yeah, predominantly gamma. Gamma will be going up 20 to 50. So when you get it pretty much like a solid line, that's gamma. So can she close her eyes for us? Sure. Just, just my eyes, but not Close your eyes and keep your mind active. Okay. So her mind is just at ease now. Uh, you can. Am I thinking about something or no? It's okay. <laughs> you can open your eyes. It's good. So notice, even with the eyes closed, this is continuing to happen because when your eyes are closed, you're still thinking. I'm going to record this so we have it. You're still thinking. You're still processing what is it going to look like, et cetera. So now we'll have Louise close her eyes, Louise, and she'll start her TM practice. Thank you, Louise. So now you can stop meditating. Sit easily for a minute and then open your eyes. Good. Yes. Thank you. So notice during when the TM practice, when she, it went up, and then it still oscillates, but it went up to the top and stayed for a length of time. It went down, it went down as she started thinking about different things. It went back up to the top again. What you're seeing is the brain is very easily moving into a state, a state of restful alertness. It's different brain waves which are being activated there. Thank you very much. Any questions for Louise? Uh, uh, just a question in general is, for example, the first part of it, and you think it goes up and then it stays straight across, it's almost straighter when she has her eyes open. What it is, is whenever there's an eye blink, it stops calculating the coherence. Because you notice the coherence is one between them. So that's what happens. So this is, it's waiting for the, that's why I asked her to look at the crowd. Because you look at the crowd and then it can actually calculate the EEG. That was great. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Now, 
Uh, Louise, Krista will help you take the sensors off. Thank you. Is it possible to see a summary of, the, of what you just reported? Um, to compare before and after? I don't have the ability to do that, but I do have some data which we can give you an example of what it would look like. Excellent. So what we, we're doing with Louise is just looking at these two sensors here. And that was just for demo. For actually research, we used 32 sensors. And this is looking at brain waves during TM practice. Um, a dot is where you record brain waves. There's a line between dots. If those parts of the brain are working together, 70% or more. You notice with TM, there's very little coherence in the gamma and beta region because it's not a process of effort or control. The coherence is in this alpha-1. It's primarily in the front of the brain, but also extending over the whole brain. And the reason we want to add that is to bring it into activity. This experience, I suggest, is, and you've heard before, is a fourth state of consciousness. What's the criteria of a higher state? It should be sub subjectively distinct from waking, sleeping, and dreaming. And we saw that, yes, that this sense of self, no thoughts. It's a state which is unlike what you would see in waking, sleeping, and dreaming. It's not an altered state of waking. It's a completely different subjective experience. Greater breadth or sense of self. The self is less in terms of outside activity and um, your experience and your social fame, more in terms of inner wakefulness. And it's physiologically distinct, as we've seen. But by going back and forth and back and forth, we should be able to integrate transcendental consciousness with the other states. And that would look like, if we could turn this into a cube and turn it on its corner, it would look like this. <laughs> Let me do that again. That's so much fun. <laughs> and this is called the fifth state, cosmic consciousness. Now that state of pure consciousness, of inner silence, which is just there for a few moments during meditation, is there 24-7. It's completely underlying waking, sleeping, and dreaming. And let's see how that grows. This is looking at EEG of someone meditating for four months. So this would be Louise, or someone meditating for eight years. In each case, TM is on the left. Eyes open is on the right. In each case, it's the front, center, back of the brain. Um, again, this is time. Each line is a different part of the brain. Notice how the EEG patterns during TM are very similar. This is eight years. This is four months. This is bringing out that idea of how we transcend with TM is effortless. We use a natural tendency of the mind. Remember, we talked about automaticity. The automaticity is built in. But look at the eyes open. Here's our gamma EEG, the person's thinking. Here's someone, eyes open, eight years TM. Do you see what's happened? Four months, eight years. What do you notice? Four months, eight years. How are you going to, when you're at the soda fountain having an ice cream sundae and talking about this talk, how would you describe this? What's happened? <laughs> yes, ma'am. This is TM, eyes are closed, transcending, the, going down the bubble diagram. This is eyes open, inactivity, reading books, talking with people. So, like TM states and eyes open states are more similar in the person who's been doing it for longer, right? Yeah, good observation. This is experience changes the brain. This is neuroplasticity. You move the brain back and forth. You go to that state of pure consciousness to develop those brain circuits so that it can become part of your daily life. And notice the alpha activity in the back and the center in the front is there while the person is waking, while the person is in class. That's when you need that state. That's when you need that breadth of awareness, that inner silence, that restful alertness. 
And that gives you the basis for being most successful in what you're doing. Now, for the scientists in the group, this is individual data. Um, this is the group data. So these are less than one year, eight years. Solid line is eyes open. Cross-hatch bar is, is TN. This is cross-sectional data, so we look longitudinally. We had people coming to Maharshi University of Management, and we looked at their EEG. This is actually eyes closed and during a task. And then we looked at them at two, six, and 12 months. They learned TM. Here they've been meditating for two months, six months, 12 months. And then we had them do a task each time. And this is what we found. TM EEG coherence went up during TM compared to eyes closed. But notice it's six and 12 months. It's at the same high level. What continues to grow is during the day. Just because transcending isn't involving individual attention, effort, ability, it's using the natural tendency of the mind. And once we are able to allow nature to take its course, it's going to give to the same effect. The benefit is being seen in activity. So let's look at the experience of cosmic consciousness when you have inner unboundedness all the time. This is the experience of someone during sleep. I'll let you read it. person is a high school teacher at the high school associated with MUM. They're able to come up with this very concrete picture of soda and fizzing on the soda. Activity, it's like fizzing on the soda. There's activity there, so there's something to be experienced. When he goes to sleep, the fizzing just settles down. The soda remains. That underlying basis, that continuum that he talks about is just there the whole time. These are what the brain waves look like. This is sleep brain waves. These are people having this experience of inner wakefulness. Uh, this is a second here. This is delta activity. It's the brain waves when the body's repairing itself. Notice what we have here is there's a lot of these large brain waves, but also this looks more ragged, just going up and down. And indeed, you can see there's this alpha activity riding on this delta activity. Here's a delta wave, one cycle per second. Then there's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, an alpha wave. So your question earlier, what's happening here? The delta is actually produced in the cortex itself in layers two, three, and five. And that's where sleep is repairing itself. The alpha is just a constant communication between the core of the brain and the cortex. It's that level of wakefulness which is now self-sustaining. These are group data on non-meditating. There's a group of short-term TM practitioners and those people reporting cosmic consciousness. And this is looking at how much of this alpha activity that we see here is there during sleep. Notice that it's already growing in the people who have been meditating an average of four years. Growth towards cosmic consciousness is not a zero one, but it's a gradual unfolding. It's like a flower opening up. And it opens up based on experience, the experiences you have during meditation, during the day. This is someone's description of their experience of and during the day. And we looked at what the brainwave is like. We gave them tasks, 17 people uh, not practicing any meditation, 17 pr practicing TM, but not reporting higher states, 17 people reporting uh, cosmic consciousness. And the differences we found were in the front of the brain. Um, and it was c coherence across all broadband, across all frequency bands. So the frequency of transcending was there, plus the frequency of thinking and acting. Overall, there was much more alpha activity. Alpha is more of a self-referral frequency. Faster brain waves are more object referral. And how their brain actually started to respond in a task was different. The blue is the non-meditating. The yellow is the people reporting higher states. You notice it's a mirror image. A simple task is you know what you have to do. It's the same response each time. The choice task is you get some information, but you have to wait for the second piece of information. 
we see the people reporting higher states are more balanced. They're not starting to respond until actually they have sufficient information. So we added those up, and these differentiated the groups um, quite significantly. This idea of brain integration, we call it because it involves coherence and these other measures. High brain integration correlates with positive things. Moral reasoning is higher, emotional stability, and so on. The way to understand this is this is a correlation coefficient. If you square it, it's the amount of variance that this predicts of the other. So if you square 0.66, it comes out to be about 40%. So 40% of the change in moral reasoning could be predicted by their level of brain integration. Again, the brain's the interface between inner and outer. And as the brain is, is a more integrated platform, it's able to give a much broader integrated picture of the world. So I have two more slides. This is taking this question out of meditation and into the world. What does brain integration really mean? Well, we thought what it really means is that you're in contact with your inner self. So you should be in contact with inner resources. So you should be more successful. So we looked at athletes. These are 66 athletes, 33 uh, world class. They finished in the top 10 for three consecutive years in Olympic Games, World Games, compared to control athletes. And they had higher levels of brain integration. This isn't a meditation study. This is more human success, human performance study. Managers, same thing, top level managers, 18 years CEO, the company had grown, higher levels of brain integration. We're on a roll, we said, let's look at classical musicians. So we looked at professional and amateur classical musicians, and they both have high levels of brain integration. Mm -hmm. And we looked into the literature, and it's found that as a child, if you learn music, your brain patterns are different as an adult. Because experience changes the brain. You not only focus on numbers and words, but you're focusing on <coughs> sounds, music, integrating your sound with other sounds. Also, this division, it was a flawed design because an amateur musician is not a less effective, a, a, a less developed musician. They just don't make their money from music. <laughs> now, I put short-term and long-term TM here not to suggest that if you practice TM, you're going to be a great musician, a great manager, and a great athlete. But do suggest that experience changes the brain. Transcending thought is developing a specific style of brain function that's going to help you be more successful in wherever you turn your attention. How do you define the Z-score, for example? A Z-score is the mean divided by standard deviation. So it's taking a number and putting it in standard deviation units. Oh, that's just the standard. Yeah, exactly. And we do that because coherence, <laughs> um, power, and CNV are different units. So to be able to put them together, we change into z-scores. So cosmic consciousness, this is also, this is a fifth state of consciousness. Subjectively, it's distinct from other states. That experience of the transcendent is now there, along with waking, sleeping, and dreaming. It follows greater breadth or sense of self. The self is now completely outside of change, outside of time, physiologically distinct. My conclusion, higher states appears to be the natural extension of development that's been going on since birth. We landed in this world, and we have this body. We can't even control it. The first thing we do is we control matter. We control the body. We're able to see objects. And then we start transcending, and then we can have some desire of what we would like it to be. And then we transcend a little bit more, and we can think about the world outside of ourselves. We transcend a little bit more, and we can think about thoughts. This process, if you get the necessary experience, continues till CC, where now who you are, the self of who you are, is something which is full, unchanging, outside of time and space, is full, while all of activity is just going on by itself. Thank you very much. That's my email if you have any questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. We've heard so much about TM uh, throughout the various speakers of this seminar, but 
I have heard not very much about the details of the actual experience and the practice. Can you talk a little bit about what those details of practice are and what they, how they manifest themselves for you in your practice? Uh, yes. So the question is about the details of practice of TM process. It does involve a sound, a mantra. The mantras that we use in TM don't have meaning. We just use their sound value. And what you learn is how to appreciate that sound at earlier levels. Now, it's not something that can be taught by words or instructions. Like, do this, do that, do this. Put your feet on the floor, feel the chair against your back. You can't do that because that's keeping the mind engaged in localized processes. So what you do when you learn TM, it's, it's almost like how I taught my girls how to ride a bike. I didn't give my girls a PowerPoint lecture. We went down to the field, they got in the bike, I took the seat and the shoulder, uh, the handlebars, and ran really fast, and they got the feel of it. This is how you learn transcendental meditation. It's always from a trained teacher. They give you an instruction, you have an innocent experience. They give you another instruction, another innocent experience. Just like riding on a bike, you get a feel of what it's like to let the mind settle down. Why will the mind settle down? Because this level of pure consciousness is free of boundaries. It's creative. It's dynamic. It's what the mind wants. Once it knows it's there, it goes there by itself. So that's the process of learning it. Uh, my own experience, it's, it's just great. It, it gives a, a buffer, a different place to live the world. Rather than lost and change and activity and what's going on outside, there's something inside which is very stable. So things happen on the outside, but they're changing. Uh, you might make money, you might lose money. You might get an A on a paper, you might get a C on a paper. These things are always changing, but something inside is not changing. And that becomes a very stable basis. And what it does is, it remember the challenge stress threshold? The only way you feel you can't make it is if you feel that yourself is going to be threatened by the outcome. When you realize that who you are is this field that's outside of time and space, there's nothing that can give you that feeling, that feeling of worry or anxiety. Yes, you may be more or less successful, but the self is always going to be there. It's always going to be full. So what that does, it changes life from having serious obstacles to just a series of challenges. It's almost you go into the day thinking, what's going to happen today? Because you know you can deal with it. You know that you have the ability to come up with a creative solution. You have the mental energy, the physical energy. And the whole process is life flowing through time anyways. And this is just what you're experiencing now. So you get a whole different orientation. I finally got a whole different orientation to what, what it means to, to be alive. Other questions? Is it possible for us to acquire the EEG uh, system that you have as a way to, to test our ability to TM successfully or not? Very good. Will this two-channel, um, thank you. The question was, can uh, the, the two-channel EEG machine that we used here, is it available? Yes, you can buy it. It's, it's third party. Um, can you use it to address your growth through TM practice? That, I don't think it will work. And the reason is, is because what's occurring is over the whole brain. And what you have is a, an electrical field over the whole brain. OK, where is this? There we go. What we have is this electrical field over the whole brain. If you have two sensors here, you're not really seeing the dynamics of what's happening. And so to actually look at change over time, you need more sensors. Device yeah. <laughs> Bottom line. To see eyes closed TM, we can say, oh, yeah, so this was happening during eyes open. This happened eyes closed. This happened TM. We see that, yes, there's something different there. And that was just to give you a sensory experience that Yes, there's something different. But to really plot growth, 16 channels. Good. Other questions? Yes, sir. So have you done the same sort of analysis with other forms of meditation? I have not. 
Uh, I have been involved in two conferences with 19 other meditation researchers across the gambit, um, Qigong, um, Zen, mindfulness, contemplative, compassion meditation, and we're beginning to talk, beginning to pull results. I haven't looked systematically at other meditations. I just use what's in the literature. Good. And behind, yes? You mentioned, or you showed the graph where the coherence of the brain was a yellow line down at the bottom during during wakefulness increases uh, for the 12 month period, but I'm wondering what happens over the lifetime of meditation and does it? They intersect. And so you see the this quality of coherence is seen, you know, somewhere down the line. That's cosmic consciousness. And that's when you have inner stability, inner wholeness, along with outer activity at the same time. So have we gone longer than a year? No. It was hard enough to do this between six and 12 months is summer vacation. <laughs> yes, John. Well, we heard from Craig Pearson that there are other states of consciousness above these five. Has any research or preliminary sort of studies in this vein been done? on those, and how would you characterize outcomes in the um, We haven't done other research simply because we don't have enough people that are in those, in those categories. And the research that I showed you here, the 17 people reporting higher states, um, three or four of them, I also asked them to describe themselves, and three or four of them seem to be having experiences of the next state, refined cosmic consciousness where they, they, one lady said she knew the chairness of a chair. Just she was so intimate with the objects around her. And another um, woman said that she looks out and see this beautiful divine intelligence reflected back at her through the trees and the sky and the birds and it's herself. Seems to be a very rich description of unity consciousness where everything is seemed to be a fluctuation of its underlying wholeness. So there was a few people but there weren't enough to actually document them. Uh, this was done in 2000. We're now redoing this. We have 42 people now. And with that, the experiences are becoming richer. We might be able to separate them out. Thank you. Other questions? One more minute. Who's going to have the last question? Yes, ma'am. Are you talking about something that is constant throughout, I mean, from uh, the rest of the person's life? Or are you talking about these um, peak experiences that, are, that, that will occur for a, a limited period of time, which may vary greatly? But. Excellent question. TC is, comes and goes. It's a peak experience. When Maslow was talking about peak experiences, he was looking at people spontaneously having this state. Because what is this state? It's just the state of the mind, just the state of the source of thought. And it can happen. It's there, it's there right now. It's there right now. And that's why you can hear me and, and you have all these ideas. You have wakefulness. It's coming from that field. But if our brain doesn't have the ability to maintain unbounded silence and focus activity, if it can't maintain that range, we tend to just get whatever is the focus activity level. But what can happen spontaneously the, the thoughts, the, the veils can part and we experience pure consciousness and so on. So yes, this is momentary and it, it comes and goes. But cosmic consciousness is something which is permanent now. This is 24-7. And it's an interesting point because if experience <laughs> changes the brain, could you lose that? You know, could something happen to the brain? And so the question you were asking originally, you know, what is supporting an unbounded inner experience? Um, I like to think that it wouldn't happen simply because you'd be making right decisions. And so you would be always having those experiences to strengthen the circuits of higher states. I'm going to end now because I believe we end at six. And so you've been a very attentive audience. I'm happy to be here to answer any further questions. Thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.